Hi, this is Chris German. Welcome back to the Apartment Dealer Show. Today, we're going to interview CoStar Group. And if you've watched any of our previous market updates, been to any of our educational events, you know that we lean heavily on the analytics that CoStar provides. Why? Because they're simply the best at what they do. That is taking a look at the entire commercial market, multifamily, retail, industrial, and so forth, and gathering the data of what's taking place uh, in real time, and also forecasting going forward, well, what trends do we see, whether it's property values, rental rates, vacancy, and so forth. So we're going to dial in real close to home here today. We're actually going to be interviewing Jared Kadri from the CoStar Group, and he oversees the uh, multifamily analytics in both the San Gabriel Valley, Inland Empire. So it's going to be a little more granular than usual, but I think it's important that to understand overall uh, what direction the multifamily market is headed, regardless of what we think should be or how it was going to be, given the challenges uh, that we've faced here recently and what we may face uh, in the days ahead with inflation and interest rates. Nonetheless, we're going to review the facts, stay grounded, be able to uh, compose ourselves so that we can make the right investment uh, strategy or develop the right investment strategy based upon the facts. So with that, help me welcome CoStar Group and Mr. Jared Kadri. So Jared, welcome to the show. Thanks, Chris. Looking forward to uh, discussing the San Gabriel Valley and Inland Empire Apartments with you. Now, our viewership is no stranger to uh, the CoStar name. We, for most of all of what we do in terms of the market analytics, we lean on CoStar. Um, because quite frankly, we feel they're the best in the industry for the information at hand. And as I always tell the viewers, uh, you guys don't have a dog in the race, whether someone may buy, sell, hold, it's not your position um, to uh, try to look to push them in either direction just to say, hey, here's the state of the market. And that's a big um, uh, deal because for a lot of the brokerage houses, you know, the information may look, you know, one direction or the other, right? Depending on what picture you're trying to paint. And you guys have been at this for a long, long time. Um, I know that you've been with CoStar for a long stint there as well. And uh, so we're appreciative, you know, with you guys taking some time with us and in advising the landlords, what is the reality of the market? Absolutely. Yeah. I'm glad to help. Um, as you said, Chris, it's a uh... It's objective data, right? That's everything that we say, all the data is there. It's telling a story. Um, so that's definitely, you know, the best way to look at things. Now, would it be a fair assessment to say that as you're speaking with clients and brokers and investors and, and sharing data with them, that after all we've gone through the last two years, health concerns, economics, politics, that many of them would say, well, gosh, it I thought it would be different, or I, I, I feel like it should be different. And yet, and not to give away the punchline of the data today, but, and yet it's, it's not as dire as maybe some would have thought if you would have quizzed them uh, the summer of 2020. Oh yeah. I mean, I think that you hit it right on the nose. Like I think when this whole thing went down, first of all, a lot of people didn't think it would last very long right at first, but then we realized we're in this for the long haul and things do not look pretty. So this can't be good for commercial real estate, including apartments. Well, we were pleasantly fooled, right? Hindsight is always 2020. Uh, we look back at it and now we have record high rent growth, right? In the United States and also in the California markets that we're gonna go over. So that is you know, much different than I think a lot of us projected, right? Because it was a healthcare situation. Um, unlike the last downturn, which was a financial crisis, this was literally driven by a pandemic, which made for less mobility. People were not in the office. Um, really, there are a lot of questions and, you know, things have really, really recovered in the apartment market. Yeah, it's, it's strange to think that, uh, or said differently, if I would have told you March of 2020, as we're all locking down and figuring out, hey, have you seen any toilet paper at any of the stores you've been to that, in the middle of all that, if I would have said, you know what, no problem, because when we come out of this, rental rates are going to be historically high. Property values, especially in single family, are, are going to blow everybody away. 
Uh, people are going to be happy to be uh, paying 10 and 15% over a sticker price for vehicles. You know, just all these things that came about that y- you, you never would have guessed. And, and here we are. And it's made good to be a landlord is the bottom line. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. I mean, we see like those inflation numbers, right? We saw a 39-year high inflation in the U.S., 31-year high in Southern California. The housing costs go into that. And you definitely see that when you look at the rent rolls for landlords. Yeah. All right, sir. Well, uh, I know that uh, you got some good data for us, so we can dig in. Absolutely. Hello, everyone. Uh, My name is Jared Kadri. I'm a director of market analytics at CoStar Group. Uh, We are here to talk about the San Gabriel Valley and Inland Empire multifamily markets. These markets have really outperformed uh, during the economic recovery. Most of the data we'll be presenting here today is going to be looking at market rate units. And we're going to be looking at 2021 year in review and also an outlook to understand where things are heading uh, for the properties that you own and manage. So first things first, we want to talk about the economy, right? What is driving this robust demand for apartments? Uh, What does the job picture like? And, you know, different things that are driving strong demand for rental units. We'll talk about leasing, um, taking a look at rent growth looking how it compares to before the pandemic, and then, of course, how do things look like moving forward? Construction, we'll get an idea of development. Um, You know, development, of course, is mostly impacted with larger communities, but I think even with the five to 50 unit landlords, you do want to know what's under construction in your backyard to get an idea of the competition. And lastly, we'll talk about investment, the capital markets. Who is buying and selling apartments that is driving very strong price growth in the markets? So starting off with the economy here, things I'd like to look at, especially for these metros, right? San Gabriel Valley, as CoStar covers it, is a sub-market in the Los Angeles metro. So you'll notice here that we'll be referring to Los Angeles for the economic data because it is the metropolitan area here. But before we do that, I want to talk about the Inland Empire. Uh, A lot of the folks on this call own or manage units in the IE. These are the top metros for population growth in the country. You'll notice that Inland Empire made the list, 0.6% year-over-year population growth as of the most recent data. Um, This is looking at metros with 1 million or more people. So Inland Empire did make the cut. And of course, that is attributed to a lot of folks leaving places like Los Angeles, Orange County, San Diego, they're kind of priced out of those markets. And the pandemic really, really drove that trend because during the pandemic, you could work wherever you wanted. At least a lot of people could, uh, especially the office using employees. So they relocated to lower cost places. Um, maybe they have a little bit more, uh, you know, less of an urban landscape. A place like the Inland Empire definitely was a good destination for that. When you look at the other places on the list, a lot of them are in the Sun Belt, Texas markets, um, Arizona, places like that, Austin, Raleigh, they have really um, had the strongest uh, population growth. But if you look at the Inland Empire as it compares to other California markets, um, it, it is outperforming, uh, especially Southern California. We look at the bottom metros for population growth. You notice that there is a trend here. Los Angeles is among the lowest for population growth as of the most recent year of year data. Uh, we saw minus 0.6% growth. A lot of these residents are relocating to the Inland Empire, right? So not necessarily people from the San Gabriel Valley. In fact, a lot of people are probably relocating uh, in this data, they're relocating from more coastal areas, more expensive areas, two places like the San Gabriel Valley, but also the Inland Empire. So between uh, the San Gabriel Valley and Inland Empire, you're getting an influx of people priced out of Los Angeles proper. You look at other metros on the list, there's a lot of California markets, right? You've got um, Los Angeles, what we're looking at, San Francisco. Um, You move up the list to Orange County, San Jose, San Diego, East Bay. So a lot of people are leaving these more expensive metros and it was exacerbated by the pandemic. Talk a little bit about inflation, switching gears a little bit. Um, you know, used car prices, energy, fuel. A lot of us have seen this uh, personally. I know I have. I just bought a used car. That was among the highest increase in prices over the past year. But there's also rents, right? Rents are a big component uh, when you look at inflation. 
And this is contributing to the surge in inflation over the past year. We reached a 31 year high for inflation in Southern California. We reached a 39 year high for the United States as a whole. That was a 7.1% year over year growth rate for prices on the CPI. Uh, and that is, of course, um, looking at the most recent data in December. So moving into the San Gabriel Valley, let's kind of get to the ground a little bit, understand what these economic trends mean for the apartment market, um, particularly those type of units that y'all own and manage. So first things first, we want to look at the Los Angeles data for one bedroom rent trends. Uh, as I was mentioning before, San Gabriel Valley is included in the Los Angeles metro. Uh, even though most of it is not in the city of Los Angeles, it's not going to be in the metro. Uh, the metropolitan area is where we get a lot of this data um, from kind of a higher level. You see the one bedroom rent trends over time. Uh, you see in green Los Angeles as it compares to the national average. Uh, the national average, of course, um, has gone up, especially since the beginning of 2021. But 2020 was a very, very rough year, especially going from March onward. That was universal, right, across the country. But Los Angeles was more adversely affected than most metros nationally. You saw rents falling all the way through the end of the year. We didn't see that pickup in rents until the beginning of 2021. And San Gabriel Valley is surely included in this, some of the strongest rent growth in the metro because it is lower cost compared to many of the other areas closer to the coast. The rents overall, this is on an index basis comparing the benchmark of January 1st, 2020, have gone up by roughly 7%. Uh, since January 2020. Those levels are still far lower than the national average. Uh, Los Angeles has some unique attributes that many of the other metros in the country do not have, right? Much more stringent requirements in terms of COVID, uh, especially in the city of Los Angeles. So that does have an outsized impact on some of the data. And we've also seen a lot of people relocating to other places like the Inland Empire, uh, Texas, Arizona, Nevada, et cetera. So that is why you're seeing the lower growth overall compared to the national average, but San Gabriel Valley is outperforming the metro, which we'll talk about more in a few more slides. So what does it look like on a unit basis, right? What type of bedrooms are outperforming? Which, what kind are not doing so hot? Uh, the first slide we just went over previously was looking at one bedrooms in particular. This is looking at all unit types from studios all the way to three plus bedrooms. Um, the green is the one bedrooms from the previous slide. You take a look at the larger units, right? The two and three plus bedroom units have really outperformed. And this was particularly true in 2020 when we were kind of locked down. We didn't know where this thing was heading. Uh, we were you know, thinking of a much more dire picture at that time. Turned out to be wrong, thankfully. And in 2021, we did see those two and three plus bedrooms go up. Um, and then the ones in the studios catching up during the year. Uh, the two and three plus bedrooms really outperformed in 2020 um, early on because of that need for more space. You work from home, you need a desk, uh, you're living at home with a partner, with pets, with kids. Uh, a lot of kids were learning on Zoom. That played a part in it. A lot of people were, were kind of tired of being cooped up in a small studio or one bedroom. They wanted to upsize their units. Um, the studios have taken a little bit longer to recover. As you can see here, uh, the growth is much higher, right? It's it, just like the other uni unit types, it's universal with overall strong rent growth, but they are lower uh, than the ones, twos, and three plus bedrooms. Taking a look a little bit more on the ground, right? We were about 20,000, 30,000 feet there. We're going to go into the San Gabriel Valley where a lot of your properties are located. Uh, San Gabriel Valley has, has shown significant improvement in vacancy, uh, vacancy compression, very strong um, going through the fourth quarter of last year. Uh, and you can see there that the vacancy rate is now lower than 2%. We had very high levels of absorption uh, in the second quarter of the year, um, not so much supply pressure, right? There's parts of LA where there's a lot more uh, supply pressure included there, and that uh, typically does have an impact on vacancies. But here, the absorption has far outstripped the supply, and that's really helped lead to a very tight market. Moving forward in the forecast, uh, we are expected to see some supply pressure uh, coming online in the San Gabriel Valley. You can see that in particular kind of in the middle, middle of this year going on into 2024. There are some notable projects 
um, late 2023, early 2024, uh, that will add some supply pressure. But still, when you look at the grand scheme of things, your vacancy rate is still lower than 3%. That is incredible, right? That's a tight market, and that does maintain leverage for landlords in a place like San Gabriel Valley. Now, looking at the rent growth, we talked about the index rents in Los Angeles and how it compares to um, the nation as a whole, but how does San Gabriel Valley size up, right? We can see here, uh, looking at the rents, the average asking rent is well above $17.50 per month now. Uh, rent growth is nearly 8%. That was last year, um, as of the most recent end of quarter data, and that rent growth continued to go up throughout the year. Moving forward, we are expected to see rent growth at elevated levels for the next two quarters. Um, that, has, that does include the first quarter, which we're currently in, but this is the forecasted end of quarter for the first quarter moving forward. And then after the second quarter, we're expecting that rent growth to slow a little bit. Now, of course, that are not exactly low rates, right? We're going back to levels that are still higher than the historical average. And then it kind of normalizes through the forecast, right? Those supply pressures will add some, um, some effect on the rent growth. We talked about that a little bit on the previous slide, but that'll mostly affect the higher end, right? The class A units that are competing with new inventory. The mom and pa landlords, um, it's kind of five to 50 unit segment, um, concentrated even in the smaller, maybe five to 20, won't feel the brunt as much as these class A properties. Mm. Now, quarterly transaction volume, the fourth quarter of 2021 was a very strong quarter uh, in many markets across the country. San Gabriel Valley, which is a submarket of Los Angeles, uh, did see a significant uptick in investment activity. We'll go over some deals in a couple more slides, but I just wanted to show you that that is the highest level uh, for quarterly transaction volume over the past, uh, what is that, 15 years, going back to early 2007. Um, those levels exceeded $400 million for the first time. The last time we even saw over $300 million was in the second quarter of 2021. And prior to that, it was in 2018. So very good sales volume, a lot of investors coming back from the sidelines. They're seeing the strong fundamentals that we outlined before. Very strong rent growth, tight vacancy, and not a lot of supply competition especially for the class B and class C properties, uh, which many of you are invested in. Taking a look at pricing, right? Pricing, of course, is a very important uh, thing to keep track of. You can see very strong price appreciation over the years, um, going back um, several years, but especially in 2021, we saw an uptick in that price growth, reaching about 10% as of the end of 2021. Um, we didn't see pricing budge as much as expected in 2020, right? That was um, not as dire as we thought it would be. You can see it go down a little bit, uh, but 2021 overall was very positive. We saw um, that price growth come up and the average price per unit in San Gabriel Valley is now over $350,000. Moving forward, we do expect continued strong growth rates on a year over year basis, uh, roughly around 10% over the next two quarters. And then moving forward, kind of normalizing near the historical average. Um, this is just a function of the fact that it's very hard to maintain these price rates, right? Not necessarily a bad thing. Uh, the price, prices will still go up. They're just going to slow in terms of the growth rate on a year-over-year -year basis. So simply said, CoStar doesn't see any adjustment in market value for the next uh, three, four years here. Uh, yeah, that is correct. So it, in terms of the value, the market value will continue to increase um, through the end of the forecast, according to our base case scenario, which is our most probable scenario. Sure. And, and it's so, you know, landlords need to be cognizant of the fact that in that case, and if that holds true, that we that would put us on a 15 year run up, essentially, from the great real estate recession, where uh, pro multifamily values have, you know, just kept trucking. And while many would have thought uh, there should have, there, there was going to be a correction. No, no. So what, what seems uh, expensive today? Well, it's going to look cheap tomorrow. <laughs> yeah, no, I, I totally agree. And, and just shows you know, a lot of us were wondering, you know, 2020 uh, with the dire situation we had, you know, things were not looking great, but turned out prices just continued to go upward. 
Uh, everyone needs a place to live that contribute to strong rent growth. And that, of course, has attracted investors to invest in this sound asset type. All right. So moving on to the Inland Empire, um, similar yet different market, right? We looked at some of the economic data with population growth. You can see uh, surely an inverse relationship. While the LA population growth is declining, uh, we are seeing an increase in population in the Inland Empire. Uh, many of those folks are coming from places like Los Angeles, right? They're priced out of these larger metros, um, especially near the coast where it's become very exorbitant. Uh, and people are moving to the Inland Empire that was exacerbated by the pandemic. Uh, of course, it's an ex exacerbation for places like LA, right? Where they're having the population leave. It's a good thing for the Inland Empire. We look here at the one bedroom rent trends, a similar chart. It's actually the exact same data um, just for the Inland Empire compared to what we saw for LA. You see a much different picture, right? We see the green line higher than that gray one, uh, the gray being the national level. Uh, just as kind of a recap, the LA market was well below the US average uh, for those one bedrooms. The green representing Inland Empire started to rise as early as May of 2020. I don't know about y'all, but when I was uh, cooped up at home in May 2020, I was surely not thinking um, that things were looking great. I wasn't in, in, in the Inland Empire, though. So uh, things were really moving fast in the, in the Inland Empire before a lot of other markets. And it's just continued on an upward trajectory. When you compare the numbers on a relative basis to January 1st, 2020, our rents are about 26% higher uh, than January 1st, 2020 for one bedrooms, which is just incredible growth. We take a look at the other types of bedroom, uh, bedrooms. We see here that the larger units have outperformed uh, inland, in the Inland Empire, similar to the Los Angeles market, and they were early movers as well. You see those three plus bedrooms. Uh, you do see, you know, obviously these cater to families and then Inland Empire has a good amount of multi-room units that are geared towards families they had seen significant growth, uh, especially in the summer of 2020, moving onward. Uh, the growth kind of slowed a little bit. And then the ones, uh, the twos, and not quite the studios yet, but the ones and twos were starting, starting to catch up. Um, now they're pretty even, the ones, the twos, and the three plus bedrooms. Uh, the studios continue to be laggards. That, that is universal across most California markets, uh, where it's just you know, a function of, again, people during a pandemic, uh, they don't want to be in a small unit that they have maybe pets, uh, family members at home. It gets it gets very tight, um, so it can be pretty hard to to live in a studio or even a one bedroom. So a lot of folks were kind of upgrading uh, to two or three plus bedroom units. And we've been uh, a bit a big advocate of the Inland Empire. One of our offices is located in the Inland Empire, and. Of course, my business started in the San Gabriel Valley. Now we represent landlords sell buildings in both uh, LA and San Bernardino County. But for a number of years, uh, we saw this trend grabbing hold. Of course, we didn't know that it would take off like a rocket. You know, it would be propelled by something like the pandemic. But we had saw this trend, and then as, as soon as you, I think one of the major pieces that was missing was major employers. And now that you have a lot of big companies that have come in to the area. Uh, now you, you have that missing link. And even, you know, for myself, putting my money where my, my putting my money where my mouth is, uh, I'm trying to purchase a multifamily property right now uh, in the Inland Empire, over 200,000 a unit. I never would have thought five years ago, let's say that I would be paying that type of money or, you know, be happy to pay that type of money. But given this chart here and what we know about the rents based upon our projected rent of that project, um, we're going to do extremely well cash flow wise because the rents are in a landlord's favor. Yeah. And stay tuned for the pricing chart. You'll get to see that that average price per unit and surely seeing what you said, Chris, a lot of folks you know, are moving out to the area because maybe they can work from home, but it's also the employers that are coming into the area. Uh, Amazon, for example, has a lot of warehouses and, you know, those are well-paying jobs, especially when you look at it relative to workforce units. So we look here at the Inland Empire multifamily fundamentals, uh, same chart, you know, same uh, characteristics as the LA one, the San Gabriel Valley, just for the Inland Empire, you see a similar trend, right? You see the vacancy rate compress uh, in 2021. We saw a record level of absorption, at least in recent history, 
um, in 2020 as people were moving out of places like Los Angeles. Uh, you notice that we didn't really see that as much uh, for the LA market. LA was still um, you know, it, losing people. I mean, LA, LA has been losing people on a net basis for quite some time, but 2020 was uh, particularly rough for a lot of California metros. That vacancy rate has ticked up slightly um, you know, at the end of last year, but we're still slight, a little bit higher than 2%, very tight levels. Um, and a lot of this can be attributed to new units coming online. Um, I was in a ULI meeting earlier today, and, and one of the biggest things people said, we did a recap of 2021. They're like, you know, what were you surprised about in 2021? A lot of folks said, they said, people are building in the Inland Empire. And I was like, you know what, that's a really good point. There are so many big developments coming to the IE, and that's really what's caused this vacancy rate to go up slightly. That'll likely be temporary, right? Because these new communities are leasing up so strong. Um, they're typically class A products, so not necessarily direct competitors to the five to 50 unit cohort, uh, but it's still good to know about these properties, right? You move forward in the forecast, we are anticipating vacancy to go up, continued supply pressure, new class A units coming to market, many of them garden style communities that are multi-phased um, in your typical hotspots, your Southwest Riverside County, Temecula, uh, Corona, and then you have places like Ontario, Rancho Cucamonga, which have really seen strong population growth over the past couple of years. Um, over the course of the forecast, the vacancy rate does trend higher just because of expected supply pressure. People are starting to build again. It's an easier place to build in the Inland Empire compared to places like LA, Orange County, San Diego. You're not as close to the coast. There's a lot more land. So it makes things a little bit more feasible for development. Multifamily rent growth in the IE has been on an upward trend over the past several quarters. Uh, in fact, we reached a rent growth of 15% in 2021. Incredibly strong growth. Um, worth mentioning that in Southern California, there was only one market that had a uh, higher rent growth than that, which was Orange County. It's about 17% rent growth. But the IE has much lower rents than Orange County, LA, San Diego. Uh, that average rent, you notice, is pretty similar to the San Gabriel Valley. It's just that the rent growth in IE is stronger. Um, moving forward, the forecast does call for a slowdown in rent growth. This is highly attributed to what I was talking about before with the development pipeline. These new units, these new units will add pressure to the market that increases competition, but largely in class A properties, the class B, class C product, uh, the Mon Pa inventory will not be as directly affected. Now I emphasize as because it's always part of the same market, but it just won't be as directly affected as class A properties. Now, looking at things a little bit more granularly, we're going to take a look at submarkets in the Inland Empire. Uh, this is how the Inland Empire is categorized by submarket in CoStar. Um, you can see the different geographies and how they've done for rent growth. What I did here, a little bit of a different approach, I wanted to see what year-over-year -year rent growth looked like in the fourth quarter of last year and how that compared with the third quarter. As you can see on the list, most markets, uh, most submarkets remained pretty steady uh, with a few exceptions. Southwest Riverside County, Temecula, we did see a slowdown in rent growth. Now, went from over 20% year-over-year rent growth uh, to somewhere around 17, 18%. That's not exactly a bad change, um, but just to note that was um, one of the ones that saw a decrease and that was largely due to supply pressure. We've seen some new units coming online in Temecula, uh, Marietta, and also places like Menifee. So that does uh, surely impact the rent growth picture there. But for the most part, we are maintaining consistent, consistently strong rent growth um, the only submarket to see an increase uh, in that rent growth to a significant extent, I shouldn't say the only one, but um, you know, one of the ones that saw the biggest was outlying Riverside County. Uh, think of this as the very rural areas uh, when you're on your way to Vegas, um, you know, out there. So that's kind of a good example of you know, the rent growth in Inland Empire. Multifamily deliveries and construction, uh, you can see the levels have really increased uh, in recent quarters. Uh, for under construction inventory, which are those blue bars, they correspond with the right side of the chart. We've seen those levels tick up substantially over the past couple quarters. We now have over 4,000 units under construction in the, in the Inland Empire. Uh, and moving forward, we are expected to see a good amount of deliveries, right? Um, kind of peaking at the end of 2022, 
third quarter or so in, in 2022. And then moving forward in 2023, you'll have some supply pressure at the beginning of the year for those deliveries. And then it'll kind of slow down. But I would not be surprised if there's continued development beyond that 2023 number because developers are very interested in the market because of these strong fundamentals like the rent growth, the population growth, and the tight vacancies. Units under construction in Inland Empire are concentrated in some very strategic areas. Uh, Greater Ontario Rancho Cucamonga, <laughs> Greater Ontario Rancho Cucamonga uh, continues to see a good amount of this inventory, nearly 2,200 units under construction. That's good for over 5% of existing inventory in the market. We also have outlying San Bernardino County, San Jacinto, River, uh, Riverside Corona have seen a significant number of people um, kind of relocating from places like Orange County. Uh, that is a good demand driver for development, and that's why builders are concentrated in areas like that. This is a good example of a project, um, one of the large developments uh, in the Inland Empire, right? Resort at Empire Lakes is 1,000 units. It's in Rancho Cucamonga, which has really benefited from people leaving Los Angeles in particular. Uh, this is a huge project. Um, could compete with some of your units, but again, most of this new product is competing directly with Class A inventory in the area. Um, this is just one of many examples of IE projects that are very large, uh, 1,000 units, almost feels like a small town. Now, moving on to the capital markets, right? One, take a look at sales volume, then we'll talk about pricing. Um, we'll give uh, Chris some, some information on the pricing and see if any of those units are, are worth, uh, worth buying based off mm -hmm. our data. So we have here the uh, sales in billions of dollars uh, for the Inland Empire by on a quarterly basis, going back to early 2007. Uh, similar to San Gabriel Valley, we saw the volume hit very high levels, right? Going back to early 2007, it is the highest point uh, by a long shot, over one and a half billion dollars in trades. The number for the San Gabriel Valley, which was over 400 million. So just to show you this sample, right? Inland Empire is a much bigger area. Uh, it is its own market of many cities. San Gabriel Valley is just a submarket. But either way, you see that sales volume reaching the highest point since early 2007, which shows you that investors are very interested in these markets. They want to buy these properties that have long-term appreciation value. They might be buying at very low cap rates, but they're interested in the cash flow and the appreciation in the long term. So here's Chris's slide, right? This is uh, Inland Empire market pricing, and then we have the base case scenario. Um, we can see that pricing over time has really surged, right? In the past several, uh, past several quarters, before then we did see positive growth, but we're still at an average market price of roughly $100,000 to $150,000 coming out of the Great Recession. Numbers continue to go upward uh, with that strong appreciation, especially in 2021. That was where we saw the strongest growth um, since the quarters uh, following the Great Recession. But keep in mind, that was coming off a very tough time. So the growth is bound to be strong. Uh, 2021 was coming off a tough time too in 2020, but 2020 saw positive growth on a year-over-year -year basis for that appreciation. Uh, we're now at well over $250,000 a unit on average, $270,000 per unit to be exact. Moving forward, we do expect, as Chris alluded to earlier during the San Gabriel Valley section, the prices will continue to surge. They'll continue to appreciate. It's just that the growth will slow, right? Year-over-year -year growth will slow, and that's why you see those purple bars kind, kind of going downward through the forecast. But that purple line corresponding with the left side of the chart is going upward just at a slower rate than before based off some of the things we talked about, the supply pressure adding competition, um, us being further along during the recovery process. The other thing that could play a part here too, which um, will be reflected in, in future forecasts and CoStar, is if the Fed does raise interest rates, we could see things change a little bit. But either way, this is a very sound market. Uh, we'll likely continue to see very, in, uh, very significant interest in the market. Yeah, it's good news. It's good news all the way around. Um, again, I think landlords would be surprised that uh, here, still no correction for the next uh, three, four years. And they, I imagine many of them would have thought differently. And for those that own outside the Inland Empire, I'm sure they're, they're quite surprised to see the growth that we've had in a short amount of time, uh, 
price wise, uh, rental rate wise. And uh, that's why we've been encouraging landlords. It's a great place to invest, to diversify your money. Your dollar goes further than say in LA County. And yet you don't miss a beat in terms of the uh, cash on cash return, given the rental rates or the appreciation, given what we've seen here recently with the run up in prices. So that wraps up the presentation here. Uh, hopefully I provided some good insights on the Inland Empire and San Gabriel Valley and overall Los Angeles. Uh, if you do have any questions for me, uh, please feel free to reach out. This is my email address and my phone number. Either way is good. Give me a shout. All right, sir. Well, thank you. Thank you so much, Chris. So there it is. Facts versus fiction, numbers versus emotion. That's the way we like it as multifamily investors. I hope you found this information informative. I hope you're excited. I hope you feel optimistic, especially if you own within the San Gabriel Valley and Inland Empire submarkets or look to own there soon. Uh, values are headed in the right direction. Rental rates are headed in the right direction. Vacancy is headed in the right direction, all of which makes it a perfect storm for you as a landlord. Be sure to subscribe to our channel. We have a boatload of content that's going to be released over the course of this year. We'll be tracking the market very closely. And we'll be keeping you, the landlords, apprised of what are the changes as they come through uh, the pipeline, whether they be with the legalities of owning multifamily, market dynamics, improving properties, and all the rest. Share a comment, share this video with other landlords that you know. I'm sure this information would be helpful to them as well. And uh, like I say, we're going to be bringing you the resources the information, and the network of professionals that will make all the difference as you build your financial legacy in multifamily properties. Chris German, the apartment dealer, and as always, wishing you positive cash flow, tenants who behave, and much protection from Uncle Sam. Till next time.